And I'm also very active in trying to figure out how do we re-engineer our legal services uh, to make sure that we're doing more, uh, quite frankly, with fewer resources. How do we leverage technology? How do we get out of the business of doing some of the more repetitive and mundane tasks so that we could do some more higher value work uh, for our business clients? I'm Chad Main, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about the intersection of technology and the practice of law. Each week, we'll talk to a mover and shaker from the legal and technology fields. We'll learn a little bit about them, what they've been up to, and hopefully get a couple of real-world tips that lawyers can use to integrate technology into their legal practices. In this episode, we talk to Dennis Garcia, Assistant General Counsel at Microsoft. We talk about lawyers' use of the cloud, law firm cybersecurity, and some cool stuff they're doing there in the Microsoft legal department to streamline their work, including the use of bots. Dennis is a native New Yorker, but has lived in Chicago for quite a while now. Believe it or not, he was inspired to become a lawyer from a television show. What television show, you might ask? That 90s classic, L.A. Law. Funny thing is, Dennis never ended up in L.A. or at a law firm. I've been living now in uh, the Chicago area for about 20 plus years, uh, although I consider myself a native New Yorker. I was born in New York City and uh, grew up in the New York City suburbs, Uh, went to school in uh, college in upstate New York at a school called Binghamton University, used to be known as SUNY Binghamton State University of New York at Binghamton uh, a long time ago. I majored in political science at Binghamton, like a lot of political science majors. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but my father always impressed upon me the importance of having some sort of tangible uh, profession. Around that period of time, I was also a big fan of a, and this is going to date me, a TV show called L.A. Law. And I was sort of fascinated with the the lawyers who worked at the uh, law firm, which was portrayed in L.A. Law and potentially even living in in Los Angeles. And so um, I decided to apply to law school. I uh, got into a number of law schools. The best law school I got into was Columbia Law School in New York City in Manhattan and uh, the Upper West Side of of Manhattan. I uh, lived at home uh, in the suburbs and commuted in uh, every day in order to save uh, some money. And I've had sort of a a unique uh, career distinction in that I started my legal career in-house working for IBM uh, right after law school. And, And back in the day, IBM had a philosophy whereby they hired lawyers directly from law schools so that they could train and groom uh, their lawyers. So I worked in-house for the IBM legal department for a little bit over five years. Uh, IBM uh, is known as International Business Machines. It also has another acronym known as I've Been Moved. Uh, So they moved me around a little bit. I started my legal career working in Connecticut for a group at that time at IBM known as the IBM Printing Systems Company. They they then moved me to Boulder, Colorado. So I spent three years in Boulder, Colorado, working as the primary lawyer at uh, the IBM Printing Systems Facilities uh, Printer Development and Sales Group uh, in Boulder, Colorado. So at an early point in my career, I had lots of responsibility working on uh, involved contracts with uh, IBM's customers and these large-scale multi-million dollar original equipment manufacturer uh, agreements. After being in Boulder for about three years, IBM moved me to Chicago, uh, where I worked as a lawyer in the field, uh, supporting uh, IBM's uh, sales and services teams in the central United States territory. So I worked on a lot of customer agreements with big banks, healthcare companies, public sector customers, uh, you name it. And then uh, I really love Chicago. I didn't want to move back to, uh, to, to New York. And if I stayed with IBM, all roads would lead back to the New York City area. So I decided to leave IBM and I had a great opportunity to work as an in-house lawyer for Accenture. And of course, Accenture is a very large uh, IT management consulting company. And so I worked as an in-house lawyer at Accenture for almost five years. And during that period of time, I worked on a number of multi-million dollar uh, business process outsourcing uh, deals with uh, Accenture's customers. These were very custom information technology deals. I learned a lot from so many terrific Accenture lawyers, so many smart Accenture uh, business folks. So did that for about five years. And I've been now at Microsoft for 15 years. It's hard to believe that I've been here for 
15 years. During the majority of that time, I've, I've been Microsoft's lead lawyer supporting its U.S. central region sales, marketing, and business activities. So I spent about 75% of my time shaping and negotiating whatever contracts we needed to put in place with our big customers in our U.S. central region uh, territory, such as our cloud computing contracts or software licensing contracts or consulting services contracts. The rest of my time was spent probably handling more general counseling uh, issues involving our sales teams in the uh, central U.S. geography, whether it be compliance-related issues, intellectual property issues, privacy issues. It ran the gamut, lots of different issues. Last summer, Dennis took on a new role at Microsoft. As part of that role, he's involved in the company's digital transformation initiative. As he explains, a lot of that initiative is centered around the company's cloud-based software offerings. I've taken on sort of a newer, uh, more strategic role as part of our U.S. field uh, legal team. And what I'm doing is I'm our lead lawyer for our uh, digital transformation uh, legal support activities. So when we think about digital transformation uh, at Microsoft and the services and solutions we offer to our customers, it's all about providing our cloud services coupled with uh, 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 digital services, with artificial intelligence, creating unique intellectual property uh, for our customers to help them uh, be more customer obsessed, customer focused, and also to help streamline their operations from a digital perspective. So I'm still working on a lot of these uh, involved digital transformation contracts, but also thinking about what's our next generation of agreements and templates, uh, fallback terms and conditions as we move to this sort of a cloud plus world uh, in the digital transformation uh, space. I'm also our lead lawyer for our enterprise services teams uh, in the United States. I'm also our lead um, uh, point of contact here in the United States for a unique initiative we have in our legal team known as the Legal and Compliance Community Initiative. And what that's all about is efforts uh, for Microsoft lawyers really all over the world, but we're also focused on this in the U.S., to get deeper with a lot of the key business decision makers and legal decision makers that are customers, general counsel, lawyers, uh, chief information security officers, chief privacy officers, and to try to uh, uh, talk to them about Microsoft's trusted cloud narrative, what we do, what we think we do to inspire trust in protecting their data and their customers' data as part of our cloud solutions. So what we'll do is we'll participate in conferences, CLEs, seminars, uh, panel discussions, presentations with customers, sort of in a one-to-many uh, environment where we talk about what Microsoft is doing to earn our customers' trust and protecting their vitally important information and data and what we're doing from a uh, security perspective, a privacy perspective, a compliance perspective, and how transparent we are uh, as part of our cloud business offerings. One of Dennis's other responsibilities and one of the main reasons I wanted to get him on the podcast was his involvement in the Microsoft legal department's efforts to retool and re-engineer how they get their work done. Much of that work involves leveraging technology, enabling the lawyers to do more with less, a common refrain nowadays within legal departments. It also involves automating routine tasks. So I'm focused on making sure that uh, uh, our colleagues have the right tools, technology tools, readiness. We're hiring and we've hired a number of new lawyers on our field team to help onboard them, to help mentor them, to help train them. And I'm also very active in trying to figure out how do we re-engineer our legal services uh, to make sure that we're doing more, uh, quite frankly, with fewer resources. How do we leverage technology? How do we get out of the business of doing some of the more repetitive and mundane tasks so that we could do some more higher value work uh, for our business clients. As noted earlier, one way lawyers can do more with less is to automate routine processes. Not surprisingly, Microsoft is looking to technology to do this work. And one of the cool ways they're looking to do it is through the use of bots. But I do believe they think I am some sort of god. Not that kind of bot, but a bot which is based on a piece of software or a script that can handle routine processes with little human involvement. Uh, Microsoft, of course, uh, like other technology companies, have made some, some major investments in the artificial intelligence space. One area which we're trying to pursue in the Microsoft legal department is how do we use bots and chatbots uh, to provide more knowledge and information to our business clients. So as an example, on our U.S. Uh, 
field team, uh, oftentimes our business clients come to us asking us to help them answer questions which are a part of uh, uh, requests for proposal documents, requests for uh, information uh, materials from our customers. And we see the same standard questions time and time and time again. And we have uh, sort of uh, prepackaged, pre-canned answers and responses. And so uh, we're actually in the midst of building a chat bot, a bot which would contain a lot of those common frequently asked uh, uh, questions which come our way so that uh, our business clients can just go to that bot and get the, the, the issues and the information which they need on their own, freeing us up time to do more mission critical uh, work. One uh, solution which we view also use, which is part of our other Microsoft cloud solution known as Microsoft Azure, our infrastructure as a services uh, solution. We've used this uh, uh, Azure uh, solution known as uh, Q&A Maker. And what this Q&A Maker is, is about is it transforms uh, frequently asked questions to a bot format. So we're using that uh, solution to make uh, to help develop bots and chatbots so that we can uh, be more responsive to our internal business clients' needs. This shouldn't really come as a surprise to anybody, but another way Microsoft is looking to streamline their work in the legal department and become more productive is the utilization of their very own cloud-based software products. All the legal professionals and the Microsoft legal team are using all the workloads of our cloud solution, Office 365, to achieve more and be productive. Whether it's Skype for Business, whether it's Microsoft Teams, whether it's Yammer, whether it's SharePoint Online, whether it's OneDrive for Business, whether it's OneNote, to be able to be more productive and more collaborative. So uh, anytime where we can um, leverage our technology to be able to achieve more and free up uh, time is, is very important for us. I'll get back to my interview with Dennis in a minute, but I wanted to take a second to introduce a new segment we're adding to Technically Legal. I'm sure some of the other podcasts you listen to have ads, but we here at Technically Legal thought it'd be cool if rather than have ads, we took a couple minutes to interview a founder of a legal tech startup. We could help get the word out about their products that they're developing to make lawyers' life easier. So for today's episode, I talked to Ryan Alshock. He's the CEO and founder of Ping. Tell us a little bit about your product. Thanks for having me, Chad. I really appreciate it. So Ping is leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning to automate timekeeping and really solve lawyers' biggest pain point, which is manual time entry. Um, and then we're using that data to do analytics on the back end and inform law firms in terms of how to be more efficient and how to price out their services moving forward. And what was your motivation to create the product? I believe in the adage of scratching your own itch. So I very much despise timekeeping. I was awful at it. I was one of those attorneys that waited until the end of every week and sifted through my outbox and my calendar meetings. And I, I just hated that whole process. And I knew I was hemorrhaging time and, and taking much longer than I should. Creating the timesheet and figured technology would be a much better solution than actually me being better at timekeeping. Okay, and you mentioned that there's some analytics involved and it analyzes data. Where does it collect that data? Yeah, so there's two input sources from that. One is the historical time and billing data from a, a law firm itself. Um, and we use that to, to perform analytics on and train our machine learning algorithms to be idiosyncratic for that firm specifically. And then of course the data that runs through Ping, we also analyze, which will ultimately be a much cleaner data set. Um, and so we have a much clearer picture of how attorney time is actually being spent. And we can apply that again in terms of how to cost things moving forward um, and how to identify inefficiencies for the client. Okay, and where can people learn more about it? So Time by Ping is our very uh, splash page website. It doesn't have that much substance. So if you're interested in learning more, uh, my email address is ryan at timebyping.com. Uh, I'd love to talk to anybody that's interested and tell you a lot more about the product and how it works. Ryan, thanks for being with us here today. Chad, thanks so much. Okay, back to the show. When we left off with Dennis, he was explaining how many of the lawyers in the Microsoft legal department use a lot of their cloud-based software. It makes sense that Microsoft will be using those kind of products, but there are still a few lawyers out there who are a little bit leery of storing their information in the cloud. However, like it or not, we're all using the cloud. If you send emails through Outlook or use any kind of social media, you're using the cloud. And as Dennis is just about to explain, 
the use of an established, reputable cloud service provider probably does a better job of protecting data than most law firms. Not only that, as Dennis also points out, if you use the cloud right, you can be more productive and probably save a little dough in the process. I do believe in assuming that you're working with a trustworthy cloud services provider, a highly reliable uh, cloud services provider, which takes Uh, which uses uh, state-of-the-art security practices, which is really laser-focused on privacy and enabling you to control and own your data, uh, which which a cloud provider who is uh, enabling you to meet your own uh, company's or firm's compliance needs, a cloud services provider which is truly transparent in their cloud business practices. If you select one of those firms, I believe that they could do a much better job protecting uh, your data and your client's data in the cloud versus what you can do on an on-premises environment. We have a data center, a Chicago area data center, which I've gone to a number of times and we've met customers there. And I, I can, can't tell you how many times I've been out there with uh, customers and their lawyers and their chief information security officer and other compliance professionals. And we'll take them on a tour of our state-of-the-art facility. Uh, and, and they go in there and they're like, wow, there is no way we can replicate the depth, the breadth of uh, security measures, operational uh, protocols, which you take to protect uh, your customers' data. It's just is not scalable. So what we sometimes try to tell our customers is, is take a, a data center tour with us. Take a look at our cloud. Go see the Microsoft cloud in action. And I think that's another thing which uh, we try to demystify t- t- to lawyers and to others is to really understand what the cloud is all about. A lot of lawyers don't have an understanding as to what the cloud is. And a lot of lawyers don't also understand that whether we realize it or not, whether we like it or not, we're all using cloud services each and every day, right? We all have smartphone devices. Uh, We're generating a lot of data as part of those smartphone devices. A lot of that data is stored in the cloud. Many of us are using social media, right? We'll use Facebook, we'll use Twitter, we'll use LinkedIn. Well, in many respects, cloud is powering social media. So a lot of folks don't realize that we're all using the cloud each uh, and every day. And what's, what's different you know, from the cloud perspective is that when you think about the cloud, it, a lot of folks don't realize it's also about bricks and mortars. What the cloud is really all about at its essence are these um, uh, very large uh, data centers, which will host uh, and contain racks and racks and racks of servers. And those data centers hopefully are employing state-of-the-art security measures uh, and practices. So the traditional environment, of course, for many years have been lawyers and law firms keeping all of their data on-premises versus using their servers, which they're either buying or acquiring or releasing. Uh, But now they can get cloud through a third party and they can get information technology computing power on a remote basis uh, and they can save a lot of money. Uh, They don't have to buy those servers, they don't have to have someone to fix it or maintain it. They don't have to uh, power up uh, these, uh, the, these, the, these server uh, environments. Um, so assuming that you're working with a trusted cloud provider, uh, I think it's unquestionable that they could probably do a much better job protecting your data and their uh, highly uh, uh, compliant and uh, secured uh, data center versus what, uh, they could, what you could do on your own. And we've seen some instances where some law firms have had some issues with regard to cybersecurity and, and data security issues. And law firms, uh, any, legal, any legal environment, are really rich targets uh, for, for cyber uh, criminals and for hackers. So I think there's this cybersecurity perspective that you could become more cyber secure if you move to the cloud. I think this is also is a perspective that if you're moving to the cloud, there are so many state-of-the-art um, solutions which are cloud-based, you could probably become more productive, achieve more, uh, be more collaborative. And I think if you're moving to the cloud, you could probably save uh, a fair amount of money. As I mentioned before, you don't have to be um, having servers on premises. You can sort of uh, outsource that to a cloud services provider. You can have a uh, remote and differentiated work environment. I know in my work environment here, I don't come to the office every day. I come to the office three days a week. We're seeing more law firms and legal departments uh, allow their employees to work on a remote basis. And a lot of that is powered by the cloud. If you have our uh, Office 365 cloud solution, you have anytime, anywhere access to, all, all, to the Microsoft Office suite of products just by having access to the uh, internet. Hopefully by now, Dennis has convinced you that using the cloud is not only safe, but a good way of getting work done. However, lawyers using cloud services need to be sure and vet the vendors they're using. 
In fact, they might have an ethical obligation to do so. There's a few states out there that have ethical opinions or rules of professional conduct addressing lawyers' use of the cloud. I'll post a link to an article addressing these ethical opinions and rules of professional conduct on our website, which is tlpodcast.com. Go to the individual page with Dennis's episode on there and you'll see the link. If you're thinking about moving to the cloud, I think it's really important that you spend the time evaluating uh, cloud providers. There are so many cloud providers out there uh, nowadays and the cloud uh, marketplace has been increasing uh, exponentially. And I think there's really four areas which uh, you wanna focus in on. The first is understanding how are they protecting that data from a security uh, perspective? Do they use strong encryption? Uh, are they out there like Microsoft is on the front line uh, uh, looking and, and trying to ward off cyber criminals? So Microsoft, we have a, a cyber crime fighting center known as our digital crimes unit. We have a cyber crime lab uh, in our corporate campus in Redmond, Washington. So we've been out there fighting the cyber criminals for so many years, everything we learn uh, about that, we put back into our cloud solutions uh, to make it uh, to make them more more robust and secure. Uh, leading cloud solutions also practice redundancy and data backup, so that your your, your data is constantly uh, being backed up. So if you're subject to a, a natural disaster of some sort, sort, and we saw a few of them this past uh, or last year at least, you know that your your data uh, is is going to be saved. At Microsoft, we also use what we call sort of these. Uh, uh, war gaming activities where we have a, a blue team and a red team. We have a red team who's trying to always penetrate our systems, and then we have a blue team who's trying to defend those systems. And we, we have this sort of push-pull uh, activity, which sort of hardens our defense. And we spend over a billion dollars a year uh, on cybersecurity. We're also focused on data privacy and control. So uh, as an example, in our contracts, we're very clear that to the extent that you're giving us access to your data in the cloud, the data remains your data. It's your data. We can only use your data to perform services and not for marketing and advertising uh, purposes. So you're always in control of your data. Uh, we tell you where your data is located. So for instance, if you provision uh, one of your tenants, meaning that if you're, uh, you wanna use a, a Microsoft data center in the US, we tell you that your data at rest is located uh, in, in, in the United States. So we think there's a number of things we do to enable privacy. There's a, a new law which is going to be coming uh, uh, on the books in Europe known as the uh, European Union General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. And I believe we were the first major cloud provider to, uh, uh, to agree to terms complying with this uh, new regulation. But we also comply with a number of important laws such as the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, the HIPAA law, which uh, requires healthcare providers to agree to certain additional protections for protected healthcare information. So we've built uh, our cloud from the ground up with a number of leading compliance uh, principles, uh, top, which are top of mind uh, to our customers. And I think a fourth key element, which you wanna find out from your cloud providers, what do they do in the area of transparency? Um, are they clear about their cloud business practices? Are they clear about where your data is located? Do they tell you how often the government may be coming knocking at your door asking for access uh, to your important data. So you want to work with a cloud provider who's very clear and transparent regarding uh, their cloud business practices. Not only should lawyers vet any outside computing services they use, they also need to make sure their own cybersecurity house is in order. Just using some common sense goes a long way to doing that too. I actually wrote an article about this uh, in Bloomberg Law, law uh, Big Law Business uh, about six months ago, but a few things you could do are as follows. The first thing, which I had sort of mentioned before, is this notion of due diligence of your suppliers and whoever is touching, any third party touching your data. Make sure that you're really doing a deep evaluation as to how they're protecting uh, your important data. Because we've seen some of these breaches being caused by third party vendors. I think that's point number one. I think another point is this whole notion of educating and continually training uh, people who, who are working uh, at your firm uh, and within your department as to the do's and don'ts of good cybersecurity hygiene. What sort of passwords should you use? Uh, making sure that you're using multi-factor authentication. And what, is, what is that? Explain multi -factor. multi factor is, is being able to use uh, two forms of uh, sort of connections uh, to authenticate uh, into a system before you're allowed access. So for instance, um, on my Surface Pro uh, uh, device. I need to log in with my credentials on my device, uh, but then secondarily, I have to log in through my smartphone. Uh, so it's sort of a multi-factor, two 
factors, uh, which, which I have to authenticate before I'm allowed into Microsoft's uh, network. So making sure you do uh, things such as that. But also, I think a constant education and training uh, of, uh, of your employees. Um, one thing which I've seen done uh, uh, is, is this notion of we're seeing more and more of these phishing scams and uh, making sure that uh, uh, employees know what these phishing scams are, where there's uh, people who are trying to get into your systems, sending inappropriate emails, which may lead you to believe that there's a legitimate email or or where, where if you if you open the email, there could be some malware which could be uh, loaded onto your machine. So, educating educating folks constantly. I think another key uh, cybersecurity area you want to focus on is to really know your data data classification. I've worked with a number of customers, especially those who want to move to the cloud, but a lot of times they don't understand the landscape of their data and the various different categories of your data. So I think there has to be uh, work done by. Uh, uh, the key business folks, maybe the chief information security officers, chief privacy officers, in consultation with the legal team to really get a handle for their data. And then they can have a better idea as to which data is more sensitive than others. And then to write practices and procedures to make sure they've got the appropriate protections for more sensitive data. I think another best practice is, is to always constantly download updates which are provided by your information technology services provider, whether they're security updates or making sure you're using the leading best of breed uh, versions of software or solutions with which IT providers uh, are using. Try not to use some of the older versions, try to use some of the more current and latest versions which have the, uh, uh, the strongest uh, security uh, protections built in there. I think there's also this notion that uh, uh, about readiness, making sure that uh, you assemble a team of folks who understand, you know, what happens if there is a loss of data or a data breach. What do you do in those uh, situations? Getting the right folks involved to help you sort of navigate uh, through those sorts of issues. And I think a last point is recognizing that when you think about cybersecurity, it's really everybody's business. It's not just the legal department's business. It's not uh, the chief information security officer, uh, the risk management people, the compliance people, but everyone has a role to play to really uh, sort of up their game a little bit in, in understanding uh, some of the potential cyber security risks uh, in a digital world and what uh, they should do to be more protective. Okay, so not everybody can create a bot, nor do they have the technical resources that Microsoft has. So where do lawyers begin if they want to bring technology into their practice? As Dennis explains here, it starts with being open to change. And he also points out not only should lawyers want to bring technology into their practice and be open to it, they might have an ethical obligation to stay on top of changes in legal technology and just tech in general. We should all be open to change and transformation and be willing to try different things, right? Uh, I think what I can see a lot of lawyers in the past have not been open to evolving in what we call digital transformation or just changing how they're, they're, they're doing their work. So I think it's good just to be open to that sort of change. I think lawyers should also seek help. Uh, and when I say what I mean, what I mean by that is that um, don't be shy in getting uh, consultants or third party resources, technical resources who know who, who knows this area uh, in much more detail. Lawyers can't be expected to be experts in technology. I think uh, there is a legal ethics requirement as part of the uh, American Bar Association model rules, which says that when lawyers use technology, they have to understand the risks and, and, and the benefits associated with the technology they're using. They don't have to be experts, but they could enlist support of people who know more in that area to better educate them. So I would say seek some guidance from a, a thoughtful consultant. Maybe you have uh, people in your own uh, company or firm who can help you. Um, I also would say start small. Uh, when you're thinking about uh, uh, using technology, don't think that uh, you need to uh, go all in in different aspects of technology, but use pieces of it. Try it out. Take it for a test drive. Uh, see how you like it. And I think also another important best practice is this whole notion of constantly learning. And something which we talk a lot about at Microsoft is embracing the growth mindset and, and always being curious and, and, and having this uh, perspective that we're constant uh, life learners. And you know, in the legal profession nowadays, there are so many uh, continuing legal education uh, seminars, uh, uh, sessions online. You can learn uh, on social media, there's lots of opportunities out there to learn from others as to how they're using and deploying leading technology. I think also um, one thing which I've learned in my career 
is I've learned a lot from some of the younger uh, junior members of our team, the millennials who seem to be using technology more than maybe some of the more uh, senior attorneys and sort of who grew up with technology. Uh, so I think there's opportunities to learn from them uh, as to uh, uh, what they feel are some of the best practices uh, in this area. And I think finally, uh, for technology to have any sort of positive impact, you actually have to use it. Uh, and you could buy the best technology out there. But if folks on your team aren't actually using it and, uh, and, and you haven't set the tone at the top from your senior leaders that you should use it, uh, then, then you're not going to see the positive impact associated with any technology. So the last thing Dennis and I talked about was the use of social media. He's a big user of social media and a big proponent of it. He thinks that lawyers underutilize social media on many levels, and not the least of which is using it for marketing purposes. I'm a huge fan of social media. Speaking of which, where can they find you? Oh, they can find me. So they can find me on Twitter at Dennis C. Garcia. That's my Twitter handle. And if you want to connect through Twitter, by all means, feel free to do so. Uh, feel free to connect with me through LinkedIn uh, as well, uh, Dennis uh, C. Garcia uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, but LinkedIn and, and, and Twitter are my main uh, uh, social media platforms. And so, of course, Microsoft acquired LinkedIn a few years ago, uh, but I was a big fan of using LinkedIn before we acquired it. But I think LinkedIn is just a great source of information and knowledge. I've learned so much about our customers. I've learned so much about Microsoft. Uh, I've also been able to uh, to network with other lawyers. I've also, when we, for instance, whenever we get involved in a negotiation with with a customer, their counsel, I'll always check them out on LinkedIn to learn a little bit more about their background and their bio. Uh, I also reach out to them to connect on LinkedIn, and hopefully that's a way which I can sort of sustain and build our connection uh, and relationship on, on a go-forward basis. And I think also LinkedIn's a great uh, place to help build your brand and evangelize a little bit about yourself and your expertise, about uh, what your company or law firm uh, is doing. I, I, use, I usually try to post or share something once a week about uh, something which I'm involved in, whether it's writing an article, maybe it's a speaking engagement, giving a presentation, being on a panel or something which we think is impactful that Microsoft, the Microsoft legal department uh, is doing. Um, and I also really do the same with Twitter, although Twitter is a lot faster. Uh, it's a faster sort of social media medium. Uh, so I'll, uh, actually nowadays, Twitter is my primary news feed. I really don't look at newspapers really anymore, though I do have a digital subscription to the, to the New York Times. But the way which I've configured my Twitter feed, I follow about 1,100 or so people or companies, and that's my primary source of information. Uh, I get lots of information about the legal profession, about cloud computing, digital transformation, privacy, sports. Uh, you know, the things which, which matter to me is, is how I, I get my information uh, through my Twitter feed. I've been able to learn a lot through Twitter, but also I've been able to connect uh, with, with other people uh, through Twitter and to retweet some of their tweets or to, uh, to comment on some of the things going on in the legal industry and also to be viewed as a Microsoft brand evangelist. We've been able to use Twitter uh, to, uh, to evangelize uh, some of the, the, the things which we're thinking about uh, as a company. So I think if you're a lawyer and if you're not leveraging social media in some platform, and even for Twitter, you don't necessarily have to be a power user of tweeting things or retweeting things, but just to be a little bit stealth to see some of the conversation which is going on there uh, because there are so many people who are out there uh, uh, providing ins information. I think it's a lost opportunity, Julie, really, to learn more, to build your brand, and also to be able to build relationships with folks who you would have never met but for your usage of social media. For the uninitiated, it can be overwhelming. I mean, there's a bazillion tweets every every second. So what do you do personally to cut through the noise or, or just make it so it's not overwhelming? Well, what, I, what I did when I first started using Twitter is I started saying to myself, I, I developed a little bit of a strategy as to who do I want to follow first, right? And I think the first person I followed was our Microsoft president and chief legal officer, Brad Smith, who's active on Twitter. And then I looked to see, well, who does Brad follow? Because maybe I should follow some of the folks which Brad follows. And then I started following bar associations, uh, leaders in the privacy community, leaders in the compliance community, areas which I was practicing in. Uh, so I started following them and seeing what they tweeted. And I would learn from them. Sometimes I would re retweet uh, things. Uh, but, but when I go through my Twitter feed now with 1,100 you know, people I'm following, you know, I'm obviously not looking at all of the, uh, the tweets. And sometimes I've 
unfollowed people when if they're tweeting things which I view as being a little bit inflammatory at times. So sometimes you got to do some some right sizing as to who you're following, right? Uh, yes. Because there is a lot of nowadays, of course, a lot of probably I view unnecessary chatter uh, on Twitter. Um, but it's sort of a, a journey, you know, in, in terms of trying to manage your Twitter feed and trying to figure out who do you want to, you know, uh, listen to, who you're, what, what you're looking at. But, um, but, but I've been using it so much now. I think I've gotten to be more skilled at trying to get through some of the, the other noise which is out there and trying to see uh, some of the commentary and information which is more meaningful to me in my practice as a Microsoft lawyer. Well, that's a wrap. Hope you enjoyed this one. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, you can check us out on most major podcasting platforms such as Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play. Get out your Kanban board and get ready for our next episode where we talk to Ken Grady. He's an attorney and a legal future evangelist. We talk about applying lean thinking to the practice of law, access to justice, and bread. Until next time, thanks for listening. This is Technically Legal.